Market Mondays is, is, is huge, yeah. huge. Yeah, it's one of those things, like, we always joke about it. People walk up to us and they're like, earn your leisure. Man, I watch y'all every Monday. And it's funny, <laughs> like, we put out episodes every Tuesday, but they're really talking about Market Mondays because we put that <laughs> Yeah, and so again, it, it was just the timing was perfect. People's knowledge uh, for this information was there, and people were home; they had nowhere to go, and people were losing their jobs and their yeah. finances were shaky. And it was like, well, this is an opportunity for you to stay home and make money. I I, I feel like uh, there's so many people who hear the words financial literacy or money management management or whatever it may be and they start to get a headache the anxiety starts to creep in you know it takes it takes some time to get into it and really understand and appreciate it and understand what it can do for you and what you guys are doing and and, and teaching out everybody is a is a, a blessing and the, the avenues and the areas that you're trying to reach out and help people with and understand it we're going to get into how earn your leisure is blown up but Let's get back to the origin for both of you. Um, Rashad, where did your relationship and the understanding of financial literacy, where did that spark? Uh, I started in my household, honestly. Um, my, my father was always an entrepreneur and he was, he, he was like the first one to really teach me about um, investing. And from there, I just always fell in love with investing in stock market. I always like, since I was a little kid, I was always fascinated with the stock market, investing and stuff like that. So the information um once again going back to home you know i was fortunate to have that early on and a lot of my peers wasn't but um for me that's where it started and then i just you know ever since then just have been on a journey to learn as much as i possibly can about investing about business you know something that i always thought was really interesting as far as business and um you know learning the inner workings of of how business actually works so that's where it started for me yeah, so for me, it, it's kind of a, I learned through my peers. Um, and so a lot of my friends are entrepreneurs. I, I was a teacher, you know, going to school from 7.30 to 3.30 every day. Um, and so, you know, I, I got to watch them be entrepreneurs and understand business through them, but also just took time and dedicated myself to understanding it on my own. Um, so I was super encouraged um, because I was like, wait, I'm grasping these concepts. They're not that difficult. I just got to keep adding time to it. Um, so my parents worked, uh, but they never knew about investing. My parents are from Jamaica. Um, so they never taught me anything about finance, but like save your money, save your money, save your money. Uh, and so the one thing that I watched them do was work hard. And so I figured like that would be the way, like my parents are middle class. If I work hard enough, this could be a lifestyle I could have. Until I started investing and I realized, wait, this is, the, this is not something that was being taught to me, but I think this could be a route um, for future success, and especially generational wealth, which is something that wasn't talked about at the dinner table, um, but it definitely is a part of the conversation now. How did you guys meet and what generated the idea for Earn Your Leisure? Um, yeah, we met, we grew up together um, the same town. So um, we met at an actual, um, it was a, a group of kids from our community that went to film, um, it was extras in a movie called Eddie with uh, Hey, you remember that movie? Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> yeah, classic, classic. <laughs> I see, like, you know, to me, any basketball movie coming up, no, it was, that was that was big time, big time. Okay, uh, Whoopi Goldberg coaching the time. Knicks. Yeah, 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 so we went to Madison Square Garden and we, we filmed a, um, a scene. So, um, I was, <laughs> yeah, I'm a little younger than, than him. So um, I was in sixth grade, he was in eighth grade, so it was different school. And he had just moved to the neighborhood. So I knew a lot of the other kids, but I didn't, I didn't know him. Um, but, you know, he came up to me and, uh, you know, he act like he knew me his whole life. So <laughs> ever since then, we just been rocking and rolling. So, yeah, you know, we just pretty much grew up, grew up together our whole lives, um, played sports together, hung out, same mutual friends. So when we was um, after, you know, our, our uh, college was over, you know, he went to become a teacher and I went to become a financial advisor. So as I was building my financial advising career, I understood the power of social media. Um, and I really wanted to, you know, become a rock star, financial literacy rock star on social media. While at the same time, he was developing, um, you know, programs and curriculum for children. So he had a, a program that he did every summer for six weeks. And, um, you know, it was it was a lot as far as like give kids internships and college tours. But one of the one of the things in the program was financial literacy. So he asked me to come in and teach the financial literacy class. So that was like, you know, the first time that we actually combined it. 
um, my expertise with finance, his expertise with education and really had financial literacy. And, you know, we taped a lot of those sessions, put it on Instagram. Um, and yeah, that was like the, the beginning of us actually working together in the financial literacy world. And um, as I said, my aspirations of, you know, building my social media was growing. Um, and, you know, it reached a point where everybody asked if I had a podcast already. So I didn't have a podcast at that time. So, you know, I thought it would be a good idea to start one. So, you know, once again, we had the relationship already of, you know, doing a, the classwork work and, you know, we just speak to every day anyway. So, you know, I asked him if he wanted to be my partner in it and um, yeah, the rest is history. How crazy is it the way I'm, you mentioned, Shad, your, your social media following was already rising, but to see the podcast, Troy, take off the way that it did, you know what I mean? Still, still young, it's, you know, you put it together a few years ago. How, how crazy is it to see the way it's blown up? It's humbling, it's humbling, um, but it tells you there's an appetite for it. Yeah. Uh, every, every day that we go outside, somebody's telling us about the information that they heard that spark something in them or help change their family's life. And so like, I tell people all the time, like that's the fuel. So we, all, we, we, did, we never went into this, this process saying like, hey, we're gonna be wealthy and we're gonna make money off this. We was like, we kind of talk about these things um, naturally every day. Let's let the people in on our conversations. We thought they were like conversations that everyone had and it wasn't really commonplace. And so we're like, look, let's just add value to people's lives. Let's get them information. Hopefully they'll execute on some of the information and it'll, it'll make a change. And um, so once we started, it was like, great. I remember we, the first week we put out an episode, I was like, wow, thousands of people listen. <laughs> like, this is, this, is, this is crazy. Like, this is crazy. And then every week since, it's, the numbers are just keep going up and going up. And I was like, oh, we got something special here. Like, people are ready for this type of knowledge, this type of education, and they're ready for it from people that look like us. I mean, we take, we take great pride in that. We, we're not in suits and ties, we're in rugby's and hoodies and Jordan. Man, man. And, Umas, and we're, we're talking about on high level topics, but in a way that people can understand. And so just being in education, and I, I, guess, I can say for sure Shai is in education now. We know we have to explain things at a level that people can understand or they'll be scared, they'll run away from it. And this is not a topic or a subject that people should ever wanna, wanna run away from because at some point uh, you're gonna have to make money to survive in this world. So we wanted to make it digestible. And I think we've done a pretty good job with that. No, no question. No question. Did you guys know off jump? Hey, this is we're wearing what we <laughs> we're being ourselves, you know, authenticity being so important. Uh, uh, was that just something you knew what you were going to do off the jump? Yeah. Yeah. It's something that, you know, we did um, from the beginning was, yeah. uh, you know, just kind of true to ourselves. And that's something that we've been pretty much our whole lives, just true to ourselves as far as the way we look at parents, how we talk, the music that we listen to, everything has really shaped our um, mold as far as who we are as people so it was one of the things that actually separated us at that time in financial literacy now it's pretty common but there wasn't a lot of people that was actually talking about financial literacy and especially the way we were which was actually like really doing deep dives and you know talking about very complex topics um dressed in just a t-shirt or a hoodie and, uh, you know so it was an interesting dynamic that people what wasn't used to seeing at that point in time so you know it kind of caught people by surprise and then we used you know, case studies of different business models from celebrities and sports figures, entertainers, and that, that caught people's attention even more because, you know, there wasn't anybody doing that at that time. So, you know, that was all part of our packaging, all part of our marketing, and um, yeah, it's worked out. Give me a, a mistake that people commonly make when they, with their relationship with money and how they view money. Um, I think they, they operate out of a scarcity mindset instead of abundance mindset, meaning like they hoard, they hoard their dollars. They're scared to um, invest money. They, um, you know, they're trying to work as much as possible for money. And that's not really uh, an abundant mindset that's going to lead to more money down the line, as opposed to figuring out how to make more money, as opposed to figuring out how to invest money. And as opposed to figuring out how to work less and have your money work for you. So, you know, that's that's the difference between, I think, you know, poor middle class um, environment as opposed to more wealthy environment. They understand that it's not really about working for money. It's about having the money work for you, where a lot of times, you know, in our environment, we was actually taught the other way around, the opposite. And um, that's just kind of like, you know, 
a hamster on the hamster wheel just running around doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, it's that it's like a paper soldier. We like to call it that, right? It's a paper soldier. And so we worked so hard to get the paper soldiers. We can't just let them sit, right? We have to have them going out there and working. And one of the other things I'll add to what Rashad said is people understanding what savings actually is, right? It's good to have savings six to 12 months, obviously for emergency expenses, but we should also have money that's investing. And so when we're talking about having it work for you, that means putting it in sound investments so that it can come back in abundance and not just keeping it short term. Um, and so we, we stress that having long-term investments and understanding that and having a positive relationship with money and knowing that it can appreciate over time, which is a goal. Where, where, does, that, where does that fear come from? Uh, you mentioned that, you know, it's kind of we've been taught the opposite. But where does that fear, that misunderstanding about how to be smart about money and letting it work for me, where does that come from? I think it comes from lack of education and financial ignorance um, that's just been passed down from generation to generation. And it's like, you can't teach what you don't know. So if your parents wasn't financially savvy and your parents wasn't financially educated and they were taught that, you know, in order to succeed in life, you just have to work as many hours as you possibly can and save as much money and, you know, just keep money under the mattress, you know, they're not necessarily doing it on purpose to try to hurt you, but that's all that they know. So I think that most of it just comes from lack of exposure and lack of education. And um, it's the same thing with diet. If you really think about it, it's like somebody could have a bad diet and eat, you know, fried chicken every day and, you know, um, all kinds of bad food. And it's like, where did that come from? Well, nine times out of 10, it comes from your environment, your family, right? So, you know, we're, we're really creatures of habit and creatures of our environment. So when you know better, you do better. So now we're in the age of information. So even if you, and this is why I said like breaking generational curses, breaking generational, you know, curses is not just a thing of, you know, mental situations is, is financial as well, because a lot of times we've cursed ourselves financially and it's, it's also spending habits as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that's part of just a lot of cultural influences and things, different things of that nature where we were taught to view money more as a voucher than as a seed. Meaning like, as soon as you get it, it's meant to be spent. Mm -hmm. Right. It, as opposed for it to be a seed to actually grow more money. Yeah. That wasn't something that was always cool. So. I think it's, it's a combination of things from you know, our environment, parents, cultural influences, all of those things kind of um, have led to a lot of people having bad yeah. um, money habits. Yeah, I'll add to that. And, um, historically, we just haven't had a positive relationship with money. If, if you date back to the early 1900s and, and far as railroads and banks and how we were manipulated into savings and our savings were put into investments that didn't turn out to be great ones, it actually hurt us. And then banks had insurance and they got money, but we got left with the short end of the stick. And so historically, you know, we we haven't had the best relationship, but that goes back to being educated. Once we start to have mistrust, then we hoard and we're very tight and we, we don't have that growth mindset. And so once we know the history of our relationship with money, we add that to the education that we're providing, a lot of people in our space are providing. Now you'll start to see that change happening and it's happening right now. With young people, you know, you can be any age and there's a lot of folks who just kind of ignored financial literacy for a long time. So you can be in your 50s and jumping on board. You can be in your early 20s. Um, how, how early should you know parents be really communicating with their kids and giving them lessons on watching their money? How what, What's a good age to start there? As early as you possibly can. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely, I would say, you know, when a child turns eight, nine, um, that's probably a good age and you can introduce the you know, some, some level of financial education and um, definitely preteen, mm -hmm. 11, 12. Um, and by the time they're teenagers, definitely. So, I, you know, I'll put it in different stages, but I feel like um, the younger, the better, even if it's just little stuff, like, you know, just taking them with you to, um, you know, to the bank, open up a bank account and just show them, um, you know, what that process is or how to write a check or, mm -hmm you know, what a stock is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be something that, you know, is ingrained in them every single day. But, you know, just sprinkle it in there. Every, and just like with your own personal task, whatever you're doing financially, yeah. you just show them and you'd be surprised, you know, how, how they'll remember that. And then um, by the time they're in high school, they should have, you know, a firm grasp because what you don't want to happen is that, you know, a, a lot of children get to college and they have no idea about financial literacy and they run credit cards and stuff and they make all kinds of financial mistakes that is hard for them to get out of. They, you know, it takes years, a lifetime sometimes to get out of a, a, some mistake that you made when you was 19.
20 years old. So, you know, if they have more education, then they'll, they'll be uh, well prepared. Yeah, get them as early as possible and meet them right where they're at. And so most parents, we're both parents, um, I, it was easy for me. It was like, all right, my kids watch Disney. It's a great entertainment tool, but it's also a company that you can own. So like, there's an explanation in that. My kids love playing Roblox. All right, well, instead of paying $9.99 every week, which uh, I'm sure <laughs> you got a, a child who has Roblox, that's what you're doing. This is now a publicly traded company. Well, let's explain what a publicly traded company is. There's always little tidbits that you can throw. Like you said, you don't want to overwhelm them, but you can just add these little pieces. Because um, like I said, education doesn't stop in the schools. It expands way beyond that. And most importantly, it should be in the home. And so any piece of, like you said, that you can add, whether it's taking them to the bank to pay the mortgage, or even showing them how to pay a phone bill, right? Everything adds up long term. You guys have a lot of amazing stuff going on. Tell me about um assets over liabilities. Yeah, so assets liabilities, that's kind of been our slogan um, since we yeah. started the show. And um right now it's it's our it's our new show on Revolt, uh, where we take a, a dive into the lives of entrepreneurs and celebrities and kind of have like an MTV Cribs meets uh a show that you probably see like the profit on on CNBC or something like that, right? Where we're actually talking about the assets, how they turn them uh, from liabilities into assets and seeing their future aspirations with some of the money they're making. Because uh, a lot of times people make a lot of money, but they have no education. And when you don't have that education, you do what you know, right? It was like, I got money, let me spend it. I'm going to spend it. I'm going to spend it. And so we get to take a deep dive into to the world of people that you know, uh, have somewhat of a, a, a status in, in the celebrity world um, and take a deep dive in, into what their world and see their vision. Because a lot of times they don't have a platform to speak about what they do in business, right? They just get to show you that they're entertainers or they just get to show you, you know, that they, they're athletes, but they have a lot of things going on. They just didn't have a platform to express it. And so we, we hope we will become that for a, a lot of people uh, in the near future. Man, and talk about blowing up. Where are you guys going to be on the 26th of November? Okay, we're going to be up. <laughs> Funny you mentioned. <laughs> we, got, we, got, we got a live show uh, at the Apollo. At the Apollo. Man, that's big time. Thank you. I appreciate that. So <laughs> that's that's almost sold out. So we're definitely going to sell that out, God willing. So that's going to be an amazing experience, you know, to you know grow up. You always hear about the Apollo. You watch the Apollo. I used to watch the Apollo. Um, so... You know, it's one of these these iconic venues, probably one of probably the most iconic venue, especially for Black culture um, in America. So you know, all of the great musicians and performers and entertainers and comics that have, you know, um, come through the Apollo. So now you can add Market Mondays on your leisure to that. Yeah. So it's amazing. The thing man. about that, that three years ago I was a gym teacher. Man, we performing at the Apollo. Like that's the power <laughs> of education. Like I always say that like people, I don't want anyone to discount that. Like education can take you anywhere. It opens doors that nothing else can. Like three years ago, I was with kindergarten students. Three years later, we're going to be on stage at the Apollo. And it's crazy because I say he's an educator. I still say I'm an educator. The difference now is that there's no ceiling on how far we can go with the education. I used to think like, Man, if I could just impact my class, man, if I could just impact my school, maybe if I could impact my district, great. But now it's like there is no ceiling, right? I couldn't impact the city in New Jersey. I couldn't impact the city in Connecticut being where I was. And now with this platform that we created, we can educate the entire world. And we're seeing it. Like we just came back from Africa and we're seeing the impact and we're hearing the stories there, right? We were in Cairo, uh, Egypt, and we're hearing the stories. And it's like this message is really growing and is hitting our people, which, which is desperately needed. As you guys are teaching, I want people to uh, uh, continue to check out the podcast. Those who are just getting introduced to it, check out what you guys are doing and can't thank you enough. And I'm gonna try to check you guys out on the 26th for sure, man. Thank you guys uh, so much. Yeah, if we don't see you on the 26th, we're gonna see you at that Barclays Center. That's oh, a yeah, fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes. Let me know, let me know. We'll come through, let me know. For sure. All right, brother. Appreciate you guys. All right, man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it.